Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. It's James Marley here, co-founder at Livewire Markets, and I have a special guest for you today on this episode of Views from the Top. I'm joined by Bobby Yazdani, founder of Coda Capital, a leading technology investment firm based in San Francisco. Bobby was an early investor in businesses such as Google, Dropbox, Uber, and Salesforce, and was one of our special international guests at Livewire Live last year. Bobby, great to have you back in Australia and, and good to catch up. Thank you for having me, thank you. Now, last time we spoke, you talked about the concept of a new innovation cycle in technology. Previous cycles had given people access to information. The new AI-driven super cycle was gonna give people access to the cognitive. That's what you told us at Live Why Live last year. Now, interest in AI has only grown since we last spoke. What have been the big developments that have caught your attention over the past year? A lot has happened since last year. First and foremost, I think uh, you've seen the evolution uh, of chat GTP, and you've seen uh, the broadening of the participant in the market. So we have Google came up putting out a competitive product called Gemini. You got to open uh, AI, continue to innovate and release new products. You have a lot of uh, participant on the, what we call the open uh, source systems. Meta, uh, Facebook is leading uh, that effort right now. So the number of participants in the AI technology market have grown substantially. The amount of money invested also grew similarly. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been now invested uh, within four blocks of my office. I think close to $150 billion have been raised uh, to invest in AI. And then um, you've seen the upgrade of the data centers so that they are AI-enabled data centers. You have seen uh, an architecture of AI evolving and changing. I'll give you an example. Like If you think about the internet was introduced to us in early 2000, 2000 early 2000, but we didn't really have cloud computing with AWS until 2008. So there's time will take to architecture of these new technologies develop and settle, and new challenges get identified and needs to be addressed at the same time. You're doing frontier work, you're finding problems, problems need solution, engineers go at it till they figure it out. So that we are in that phase. That the architecture hasn't settled yet, but a lot of people are working on it, and there's a lot of frontiering work is being done to move the AI line forward. They keep going forward. So a lot has happened since a, uh, a year ago, I would say, in constructing and developing this new frontier. AI is not a new concept. It's been around for, for decades, I think you, you said last time we caught up. But you did talk about us being in a new super cycle. You've invested through super cycles before. What have you learned about how long they take to play out, where does the opportunity arise, and where what might we be at the moment? Yeah, for um, a super cycle to accelerate, or the adoption of a super cycle to get accelerated, many conditions have to be right. So if you think about mobile phones, they've been around from Nokia's time, but the acceleration of it happened with iPhone in 2000, call it 7, 2008, and the App Store was really, was uh, helped accelerate the adoption of it and globalized uh, the mobile phone. Same thing is, it's happening with AI where the conditions have to be right in many fronts for this to accelerate. So sometimes the, the different pieces have its own life cycle that it needs to be develop within its own time frame. So right now on the compute front, we talked about NVIDIA in the past, has progressed significantly. In the front of the data, for instance, we progressed significantly with uh, companies like Snowflake, uh, Databricks, and many other ones where they have streamlined the management of the data, both from the training of the data, as well as from the leveraging of the data set. On the algorithm front, you're seeing significant amount of um, uh, innovation and acceleration. Having said all of that, I hate to say this, but I'm gonna say it, AI is not reliable yet. AI is not reliable yet. 
you can use AI, but it's not reliable. You, I'm sure you have used. Yeah, I chat. use it. What do you think? Correct, I correct it. It's. Is it reliable for you? It can do a job, but it doesn't do the whole job. That's what I'm saying. So imagine that you can't give the control of the airplane to AI yet. Yeah, you don't trust it. Well, it's not reliable. I we start to trusting it, so the trust curve has gone up, but. Are we relying on it? That's a separate issue. Yeah. So I think we are in, the, in that period that it's going to mature, but there would be a point in time that you're going to say, this is reliable. And so let's talk about investing during these times where, with, where there's a lot of money being invested, there's a lot of interest, the, um, there are more players coming to market, there are more people using it. What have you learned about sourcing good investment ideas during this type of environment? You know, um, since the last time you and I talked, I have made probably only one or two investments in AI. And the only areas that I've invested in AI was in cybersecurity because um, it was not uh, uh, generative AI, which you were talking about earlier about, uh, you know, it's not reliable. The AI I'm talking about is machine learning and predictive AI where I leverage those algorithms to be able to do predict predictive actions. So I have been investing in AI, but I've not been investing, I'm not touching foundational model, I'm not touching generative AI, nor I am touching on the applications that are built on open AI or open AI-like services, because I don't believe they are reliable yet. My focus, of course, is enterprise technology, our companies that we invest in serves the enterprise and the government, and they're dealing with core business processes of these businesses, those technologies have to be reliable. Yeah. Right. So I have been um, um, sourcing opportunities in what we refer to as vertical AI. These are a particular set of companies that you leverage AI, not necessarily generative AI, but more, much broader than generative AI in machine learning or what have you on deep learning that marries uh, uh, the localized as well as industry specific data for specific business processes. That area, we are sourcing opportunities and investing in it. But we've been very hesitant um, as the architecture is getting developed to go necessary all in. We've never bet on the first horse out of the gates. Yeah. So we've always been patient with our capital, but not that we are not learning. We are constantly learning and observing and developing viewpoints, but we have not been um, fast. We've been slow. You mentioned there you invest and focus on the enterprise technology rather than broad technology. Mm -hmm. Why is that? That's our expertise. I mean, um, so as an investor uh, and as a financier, both investor where I have invested in other managers or as a financier, now someone who manages capital, I think um, the world is becoming so intensely knowledge-based that you gotta have deep expertise and define your lanes that you wanna be good at. So I don't believe the, the, the things that I'm working on are alpha products or alpha strategies. So I believe in a specialization and concentration. And when you do a specialization and concentration, you cannot go broad. So we decided that we're gonna focus in enterprise technology. We don't touch consumer. Even market-wise, we only invest in the US. So where we are comfortable and understand uh, the work we can do in that geography. And then within enterprise, we also have sub-thematics. Example, we are very focused on cybersecurity, or we are very focused on a construct called digital twins, or we are focused on vertical AI. So we define that further of what are the specific strategic areas within the enterprise that we think the puck is going, and we want to build a portfolio against it. In that enterprise market, what are some of the recent developments or catalysts that have taken place that have created net new problems or new problems that haven't yet been solved? Yeah, you're asking a very good question. So the, this construct of the net new 
uh, there, uh, there are two types of net news. There is a net new uh, when there is an existing problem when the technology has not addressed it before. Or there is a net new where there is a new technology arrived because there are new problems have created. Yeah. So with the arrival of the AI, there are a lot of new problems <laughs> that this technology has. It's not necessarily a problem, we should say opportunities around AI to managers. For instance, we were talking about how do you make AI safer or how do you make AI more secure or how do you manage AI workloads in large data centers. So the arrival of the AI created net new problems that came with AI and there are companies being created around it that address. And then uh, in case of the new problem, uh, old problem applying, there are very interesting creation of new companies where AI is eating away on services where you're actually taking services dollars and in, uh, companies are taking their services dollars investing in AI, whether it's support, whether it's sales, whether it's um, content creation and many other areas. Now, we are focused specifically in the enterprise right now. We think cybersecurity is, um, is still a major challenge and ever increasing challenge for the enterprises and governments. We think the transformation of industries that haven't really created their digital twins yet, it's the, uh, there's tons of opportunities in that space. Yeah. Um, and then um, the, the application of AI into core business processes are a huge opportunity set. And then uh, next generation data centers are gonna be a very important uh, and, uh, you know, the strategic part of what we are going to do is to, not necessarily, I'm not interested in the real estate or the size of it, I'm mostly interested in the technologies and the power and energy consumption in the data centers. Which of your companies are attempting to solve some of these problems? Like, do you invest in, in data center companies? Are, are these the sorts of things that you're looking at? Right now, uh, one of the core thematics, we are focused on energy consumption and asking ourselves, how does a data center or how we'd want to morph a data center into the future where you use less energy? Uh, so we are looking at um, different type of what we call cooling technology, where you can increase the speed of computers, but you're lowering the temperature. So right now, the, uh, the, the core compute can go faster, but the temperature is preventing it to go faster. So there are multiple technologies being developed to, in terms of the cooling of the chip, cooling of the box, and cooling of the space. Yeah. So many different new companies in that space. On the digital twin, we have many interesting uh, companies that uh, we've invested. I'll give you one example. Um, for instance, uh, uh, we're invested in companies that are completely automating a design of telecommunication networks where network engineers and civil engineers used to create these uh, designs. And now machines can optimize that and create that, including doing entire drawings of a cell tower, where you used to have many engineers had to create those drawings to submit to the government to get permit to install a piece of equipment. All of that is being digitalized right now. So there's a lot of uh, areas within different industries, different business processes where we are digitalizing the work of people around the technology, yeah. if I'm making sense. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, it's being absorbed into the technology. Bobby, you mentioned earlier about the amount of capital that had been raised within a few blocks of your office. And last time we spoke, we were still cycling off what had been a really difficult period for uh, venture capital um, after a, the, the frothy markets of 2020, 2021. What are you seeing in terms of activity, deal flow? Has it reached fever pitch? Is it picking up? What's the, oh, the it's temperature? Quite, it's quite rational. I think there was a period of exuberance in 2020, 2021, when you had a zero interest rate. 
and since then the re uh, interest rate as we all know have gone up there is a rational environment around risk assets and i think the participant um, first of all this is a risk capital venture capital so you people get paid to take risk yeah. <laughs> this is not a yield asset this is a growth asset uh, so you do want people to take risk that's frontiering investing that's how it goes forward that's how it goes forward so i think it's rational i i think that on the high end of the ai we are talking about large language models or what have you the players the people who finance these efforts are either large technology companies like amazon and google and apple and uh, uh, microsoft or what have you or sovereign funds i mean this is not for your typical venture capital investing yeah. idea. So we've not touched any of those. These are above our pay grade. <laughs> we are humble about bigger, it. Bigger checks. But that's not what we need to do to generate alpha for our investors. Yeah. And uh, those are very different type of investing. It's like building infrastructure. Yeah. Infrastructure is government investing in some ways. So it's similar to that. But no, it's very rational. I think the uh, there are incredible entrepreneurs uh, with incredible insights have constantly thinking about how they're going to change the world still hasn't stopped <laughs> and you mentioned earlier you've been circumspect or patient in deploying your own capital yeah do you expect that to accelerate or is that just part of how you invest uh, no it's just uh, you know our strategy our firm and our strategy is we've designed an alpha product and it's governed by the mandate of focusing on US and enterprise technology and it's also mandated uh, to have uh, concentration both in terms of the number of names and the size of ownership. So every portfolio that we put together is intended to be a strategic portfolio five years out to seven years out and we have a uh, limited number of resources. So people compete for those limited resources within the firm. Best ideas bubble up. And uh, uh, we typically like to uh, pace ourselves because by pacing ourselves, we're using time to our advantage so that we are constantly learning and deciding where to go. And uh, not necessarily, we don't want to get paid to uh, speed invest <laughs> yeah. we want to get paid on return on capital yeah. and we think that there is always another idea we don't know what or we haven't seen yet <laughs> great well bobby I, i'm conscious that you've got some other engagements while you're here thank in you Sydney. thank you for um, having me it's been me. lovely to see you again thank Thanks you so, so much, much. For talking about life. yeah i appreciate that thank you for having me well ladies and gentlemen i hope you enjoyed our catch up with bobby yazdani from coda capital remember check in on our youtube channel each week we're adding fresh content like this all the time